from Neogen that are here to speak on a variety of topics that deal with genetics and genomic testing and then the final product of that genomic testing or one of the final products of that genomic testing with the genomic enhanced EPDs. Uh, three individuals that are very, very knowledgeable in their fields. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce them. We're actually going to have a little switch in our plans. We're going to start with Jill Ginn. Jill began working with Neogen or GeneSeq in 2013, uh, coordinating sales and marketing for beef genomic profiles in the state of Texas. So a lot of y'all already know Jill. Uh, in this position, Jill consults with cattle producers on how to utilize genomic results, make genetic improvement in their herds, and she works with breed association staff and university extension to educate the beef industry on the value of genomic testing. And then we will have Nate Smith. Nate is a territory manager for Neogen. Nate grew up in South Central Kansas and while pursuing a career or a bachelor's of science in animal science at Kansas State University, he worked with Iowa Lamb and Superior Lamb Corp. After college, he returned to his family's livestock operation and consulted for the American Simmental Associations and North American Limousine Foundation. In the Eastern Territory, Nate currently resides in Colorado and he is in charge of Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. And then finally, with the final product, we will have Carrie White. Carrie has been working as a genetic evaluation scientist with Neogen since February of 2018. Her primary responsibilities include performing routine evaluations for Neogen genetic evaluation customers, as well as doing exploratory research and novel traits for selection in beef cattle. Uh, Carrie works extremely closely with John Janot, who most of y'all have heard us mention on our genetic runs. So Carrie, since she came on, she and I have worked closely as well as with John. So I'd like for y'all to give these guys a listen. They're all very knowledgeable and have some really great information. Well, howdy, everybody. Um, as I said, my name is Jill Ginn. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I do reside here in Texas. Um, I grew up in the Texas Panhandle in a small town called Hereford, uh, and now just live down the road in Godley, Texas, which is just southwest of Fort Worth. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about DNA and how we can incorporate that into your herds. And so I'm going to go ahead and get started, and then um, we'll move on to the other speakers as we go. So for those of you who are not familiar with Neogen uh, GeneSeq, we are the world's largest animal genomic uh, facility. We have labs in over 11 countries, four continents, I believe. We have over 1,000 uh, employees um, worldwide. We also work with scientists, uh, about 150 of them globally as well. Um, our labs are that uh, we kind of, our, our flagship labs would be Scotland, uh, Brazil and Australia, and then our flagship lab is in Lincoln, Nebraska, and that's where all of your samples would go to be processed. Um, we do uh, test over 4 million samples a year, and just to kind of give you an idea of how much that's grown, when I started six years ago, we only processed about 500,000 samples a year. So in that short amount of time, we have really grown the business, the genomic business is just booming uh, in the U.S. and outside. So we're gonna talk about genomic testing uh, in the seed stock industry. So why do we use genomics? Well, it's basically the tool that we use to accelerate genetic progress. Some things that we can do with genomics is identify parentage. We can manage genetic conditions. We can manage those convenience and marketing traits. And then ultimately we can get genomic enhanced EPDs, which is gonna give you faster genetic progress, give you higher accuracy on your EPDs, help you measure those traits that are difficult or expensive to measure, and then ultimately give your customer, your bull buyer, more confidence in your product. So we're gonna start with parentage. Is anybody out here running any parentage tests right now? Got a few? Okay. So the reason we do parentage, especially if we're running multiple sires in a pasture, is being able to identify those sires that are siring the calves. So we may have some bulls out there that are covering a lot of the cows, and then we may have some that are sitting under the shade tree, not really getting their job done, right? We don't know what's going on with them, but they're not breeding any of our cows. And so here's just an example of a multi-sire group that we have. 
Um, and just to show you the variation in the number of uh, cows that these bulls are covering. So you can see bull 406 is doing a really good job for us, but bull 504 over here is not getting anything done. And we're still putting the same amount of resources into him that we are into the other bull. And so we're wasting a lot of money and a lot of resources there. An example would be if you take, uh, let's say bull 405 and bull 504. Both of those bulls cost us $4,000 uh, when we purchase them. And we're gonna keep them in our herd about five years. How much are they gonna cost us per their sires calved or their calves sired? The bull 405 is gonna cost us about $38 per calf sired, the other bull, 504, is gonna cost us $266. So that really allows you to start making some economical decisions based on what these bulls are doing for you. So we've got this group of bulls out in the pasture. And we've got this one over here that didn't breed any of our cows, okay? But yet, he, he passed his breeding soundness exam. So what's going on with him? He should have been ready and willing to get out there and start doing the work. The bull that had the 47% of the, the cows that he covered, we don't like his calves. So being able to identify those bulls and which ones are throwing which calves allows us to make better economic decisions in our herd. So this isn't something that a beef master has to worry about right now, which is genetic defects, but this is something that the industry as a whole um, has dealt with. So this is an example of a defect that happened in the Holstein breed. There was a bull named Pawnee Chief, and he had 16,000 daughters, 500,000 granddaughters, and over 2 million great-granddaughters. He was very prolific. I think he was responsible for about 14% of the Holstein cow herd. So he had a single uh, deadly mutation that ran through um, his line, and it caused early-term embryonic death or spontaneous abortions. They estimate that he had over 500,000 spontaneous abortions because of this deadly mutation. That cost the dairy industry a lot of money. So we need to be able to identify those defects and make sure that we're managing around them. This is one that y'all may have heard of. It's developmental duplication or DD, which is in the Angus breed. Um, and again, if we can be able to identify these defects, then we can make sure that we manage around them so that we do not uh, keep that going throughout our operations. So the next thing we're gonna move on to is improving traits that are expressed or difficult to measure or express later in life. And so those are things like stayability, things that we can't measure until that, you know, till the end of that cow's life. Um, things like residual feed intake. Some of you are maybe using the grow safe system to collect data. Um, that's very expensive to measure, right? And then we have things like pulmonary artery pressure for those people who are in the, in the mountains. Um, and then the BRD, those are all things that are very difficult to measure, expensive to measure, and can't be measured till late in life. Other things that can't be measured till late in life are our carcass traits. They can't be measured until after harvest. So genomics allows us to, to um, test for those things and kind of move the timeline up on those. So why do seed stock producers genomically test their bulls? Well, ultimately, they want to increase the value, the accuracy values on their young and unproven animals. You want to shorten your generation intervals, and you want to be able to predict the EPDs for those hard to measure traits like we just talked about. Basically, DNA allows us to um, look beyond just the pedigree and the phenotype of those animals. So how many of you in here can tell me the difference between these two cars? And I know there's gonna be some guys in here can, who can do this, but these are Dodge Chargers. So which one has the most horsepower? The one on the left, that's right, because he knows, cow, or knows uh, cars. But really, for the most of us, we can't just look at those and know which one's gonna have the Hellcat motor and which one doesn't until we look under the hood. And then that's when we know. And that's what genomics does for us as cattlemen. It allows us to take a look under the hood or under the hide, if you will, to see their true genetic potential beyond just their phenotype and their pedigree. 
So traditional EPDs have always been measured by adding your pedigree, the individual's own records, his birth weight, his weaning weights, things like that, and then his progeny. When you add in DNA to that, that increases the accuracy, but it also allows you to get information on an animal, on a young animal that doesn't have any progeny on the ground. So if you don't have the progeny, you just have the DNA, you can still have a high accuracy EPD. This um, is an example of taking a trait like Cavanese maternal and the amount of genetic progress that you can make by, oh, sorry, I don't know where my pointer is. Well, I don't know where the pointer is, but if you um, just take the bull's phenotype and you make your selection based on that, you can make some genetic progress. But if you come over here to the right or the left and you add in the bull's genomic enhanced EPD, you can make even more progress. And if you're also testing your females, then your genetic progress jumps up to about three and a half times that of just looking at the phenotype of the bull itself. Okay, so we have a young, unproven bull. He's got an accuracy of about 0.05 on a trait. If we add in genomics or DNA, it's gonna increase that accuracy to 0.20, which is a pretty significant increase on an animal that has no progeny on the ground. If that animal has a 0.50 accuracy to begin with, he's already got 40, 50 head on the ground, um, you add in genomics, you're only gonna see a, just a slight increase on your accuracy. And on a bull that has thousands of progeny on the ground, you're not gonna see any increase by adding genomics. So the real value is adding that genomics on those young and unproven bulls and females so that you have that information earlier on. So I'm sure y'all are just like me. It's our time, there's never enough time anymore and our time is very valuable. And so with traditional EPDs, it's taken us anywhere from three to five years to get growth in car carcass EPDs. And for maternal EPDs, it takes at least five years. With a single genomic little sample, you can take on the day of birth, 30 days later, you can have the same quality information on that animal that you would if you waited those four to five years to gather all that data, okay? So it really helps us speed up that ge generation interval and the genetic progress. Uh, one thing that we're also able to do now, we have work with a guy in Kansas, and he does some embryo biopsies and he can send us some cells off that embryo, and we can genetically test that embryo. We can do a parentage test on it, we can do a defect test on it, and we can do a genomic enhanced EPD. So you can have all that information before you ever implant that embryo. So those are just some of the tools that are available to you guys out there. So the tools that we have with Neogen that help you achieve genomic enhanced EPDs. Uh, the first one is our GGP, GeneSeq Genomic Profiler. It's a 150,000 SNP chip. This is what we recommend that breeders use for their AI sires, donor dams, and those very influential animals in your herd. That test, um, you can also run coat color, horn pole, um, any defect test, which you guys don't have to worry about. Um, on that test as well, and you can also get the parent verification that we talked about earlier. And the price on that test is $85. Our GGP, or GeneSeq Genomic Profiler 50K, is what we use on our walking sires and our females. It also can have add-on test and includes parentage as well, and it's $60. So most people generally try and stay in that area, especially if they're having to run any defects, okay? So if you're having to run coat color or horn pole, that's the test that you wanna run. And then our GGP ULD is excellent for your replacement heifers, but overall for your herd, as long as you aren't having to run defect tests. So if you're wanting to test your cell bulls and you don't need coat color, horn pole, or any defect test, then you can use the GGP ULD. It also includes parent verification. And this is one of the best values on the market right now, and that's at $35. Um, to get you all of that information. So that gets you your parent verification and your genomic enhanced EPDs on your animals. 
So ultimately, getting genomic enhanced DPDs on your animals is going to create greater confidence in the product that you're selling to your customers. So they're going to know that when they buy this bull from you, it's been genomically enhanced, and they know that, you know, they have confidence in the data that you're giving them. You're going to be able to make faster genetic progress in your herd because you're going to have that information sooner and more accurate information. And then you're going to better be able to mate the right bull to the right female. So now let's talk a little bit, kind of change directions a little bit, and we're going to talk about genomic testing for commercial females. We have a customer up in Nebraska, and when we sat down and talked to him about genomics and, and the tools and how they worked for him, he, he made a really uh, profound statement. And he said, you know, in, we can now make the progress in the life of a cow that once took the life of a cattleman. So these cattlemen's fathers have worked over and over and over for many years, 40, 50, 60 years, to create a herd that fits their needs. We can do that now in the life of a cow. We don't, we don't have to wait all those generations to make the changes that um, we can make today. So um, just recently, we launched the Igenity Beefmaster product uh, with the Beefmaster Association. And um, so we're gonna kind of lay, lay that out for you here today. The Igenity Beefmaster product is for commercial heifers that are 50% Beefmaster or better. And it allows you to determine what the genetic potential of those females is uh, for, for your bull selection as well. Igenity Beefmaster is $25 uh, and it includes these traits. So we have birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, milk, many of the same EPDs that you have now at the Beef Master Association, scrotal circumference, marbling, fat thickness, ribeye area, and tenderness. And then we've got two in indexes, a maternal index and a terminal index. And then on top of that, it also includes parentage. So for $25, you're getting parentage, which is normally, uh, it, well, it's a significant portion of that $25. For just a very small amount more, you're getting all of those traits and more information on your females. This is what the report is gonna look like. So um, you're gonna get a one to 10 score on each of the um, traits that we're measuring. Uh, you'll also get the maternal and terminal uh, indexes right there. And, um, and you'll get a list like this. Um, from there, um, you can use this information to sort your animals, to sort your heifers, um, to, to make sure that you're keeping the right ones in your herd, and if you're selling certain heifers out of that group, then you can also sell them as genomically tested heifers so that your buyers know exactly what they're getting, which makes it easier for them to buy a bull to complement those heifers. So the more we can know on both sides of the equation, the better off we're, we're all going to be. So the Identity Beef Master um, helps you identify which heifers you want to retain and then make the, right, uh, reta the retained heifers to the bulls that complement them the best. Also, you're going to be able to identify the sires through the parentage part um, of those retained heifers. And then you're going to be able to promote your cattle based on those identity results. So you're going to sell your profiled heifers, as I said. But also, there's quite a few marketing programs out there that if your heifer mates to your steers are genomically profiled, then the steer mates actually qualify for the marketing program. So that's also important to know as well. So if you're testing with the Identity Beef Master, you're going to be able to um, create a cow herd that has less calving problems. You're going to be able to wean heavier calves produce higher value replacement heifers, and ultimately produce feeder calves uh, due to ex that are in high demand due to excellent growth and efficiency. So now let's, well, if you take a look um, here in the middle, you'll see that we have the GGP 150K, and that's on your AI sires and donor dams like we talked about. That's the genomic enhanced test that allows you to get information on those animals. If you drop down here to the bottom left, you have the GGP 50K, uh, which is for your young sale bulls. And then um, up in the top left there, you have the GGP ULD 
um, that we talked about that you could use for screening your heifers, your uh, seed stock heifers, but also for seed stock bulls that do not need a defect or a coat color or a horn pole or anything like that. And then at the top right, those are for your commercial cattle. That's for your 50% beef master or better commercial females um, that you can test on that as well. So ultimately, genomics is going to help you by saving you time because you're going to be able to identify those superior genetics um, earlier on in their life. That's going to save you resources, uh, time, money, um, and it's going to help you reach your goals sooner. And then ultimately, doing what's right for your customers and providing them information that gives them confidence and helping them to mate the right bulls with the right heifers, that's going to create greater demand for your genetics. So this is uh, one of my customers up in uh, Throckmorton, Texas, Donald Brown. And he always t tells us, he says, you know, there's a lot of technology out there. There's a lot of new tools for us to take advantage of. And he said, and you don't have to take advantage of that. You don't have to change, but you are going to have to compete with those who do. I think that that goes to, for us within the seed stock industry, but I think in the beef industry as a whole. So there are things that our competitors, the chicken and the pork industry are using, the tools that they're using, and we don't have to use those tools. They're available to us. We don't have to use them, but we have to compete against them. So how are we going to better do that? We're going to have to take on those t tools and technology and use it to the best of our ability. So that's all I have for right now. Um, Nate is going to talk a little bit more about how we get to this point, what sampling we do and how do you sample and things like that. But if anybody has any questions about what I just presented, I'd be happy to answer those at this time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He, he asked if, if y'all could get a print out of my slides, and I'd be happy to provide that. Yes, sir. Good. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. I understand. Yes, sir. I can get you a copy of these slides. Absolutely. I'll get those to Lance, and then he can distribute those. Anybody else? Yes, sir. It does not. So do you, can you explain that just a little bit? Sure. Okay. So um, when she is saying like 150K or 50K, what's different is the amount of information that we get from the genome in each of those tests. Um, so the idea would be that the 150K, we get 150,000 pieces of information across that animal's genome. Um, and the reason that you want that, so almost like 150,000 pictures of how that animal's DNA looks and what he's going to pass down to his offspring, the reason that's important in animals that make a lot of influence in your cow herd, so AI sires, donor dams, they have a lot of progeny, more than, you know, maybe a walking sire or just a regular female, right? They really influence your herd a lot, and so their genetics are going to pop up in a lot of different places in your herd. So we want a really good idea of how their genome looks so that we can better predict their calves, because their test doesn't affect just them, right? You, wanna, uh, you want their test to also make their progeny more accurate, right? And so that's why you want a lot of information on those high-use animals. Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Sequencing would be next. Um, and I, can you speak to sequencing as well? Sorry, I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> defer to my expert. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about this in my presentation, but now what we look at when we're looking at snapshots of the genome is where that animal 
is different than we would expect it to be based on its parentage and things like that. Um, those are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. You've probably heard that, it's kind of a buzzword. SNPs is something you've probably heard. And it's basically um, just a place where that animal's genome is different than we would expect it to be. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in my presentation. Um, but it's not as complete of a picture as it would be if we went through that animal's entire suite of DNA and said what it was at each individual location. That's called sequencing, um, and it's been sort of unattainable until maybe really even just the last five or 10 years. Um, and it's the most complete information that you can get. It's been expensive. Um, but the way that we're starting to sort of process things, it actually might be cheaper than just looking at where the DNA is different because you can look at the whole genome every time. Um, so it's just another way of saying, um, how can I confidently say what this animal's DNA actually is? What did he actually get from his parents? So. Did that answer your question? Anybody else? Okay. Thank you all very much. Guys had me down here, but since we're going to be looking at some sampling procedures, I'm actually going to start around a TSU gun and a box of TSUs for you guys to look at in case you've never actually held one or looked at any of them. And while I'm speaking, if you guys have got any questions, feel free to ask them, but I'll just start this over here. And if you guys want to take a peek at it and just pass it around the room, that'd be great. So. Well, like Lance had said, um, I originally come from South Central Kansas, where we ran a kind of a diversified livestock and crop farm. Um, we'd run typically 12 to 2,400 head of stalkers every fall, and we had a bunch of mama ewes too, which was kind of odd for that part of the country. But after that, I was lucky enough after college to work in the uh, seed stock industry for two different breed associations while also running a recip herd for one of my close friends. So I've had a fair amount of travel experience, but this has so far been one of the more enjoyable experiences I've had talking to producers like you. So today after Jill kind of explained where we go with the DNA and what use we can put that data to, I thought it'd be good to look back and how do we actually capture and collect the tissue and the medium that we test to find that information. So today's agenda, kind of wrap it up, put a little bit neat bow on it, includes how the collection processing and the failures of them, the difference between hair, blood, and TSUs, and the best practices to collect those. And then after we do get those collected, how should we care for those to make sure we ensure the best actual sample collection? How do samples and why do samples get contaminated? What information on the actual DNA card or on the manifest is important and why is it there? What causes delays in sample reception? What causes the failed samples? And what does it mean? And how did it come to be that way? And what contributes to a bad sample? So we'll start off with one that was originally kind of the best way to go, but now we're slowly starting to find better ways and better mediums to pull. But we'll start with hair collection, which I don't know how many of you guys collect hair still for your DNA samples. Okay. So it's one of them that's becoming less and less common because it is a very labor intensive medium to work with when it gets to the lab in Lincoln. Because each one of those little hair follicles there, the very root of them has to be punched off with basically the equivalent of an ink pen by somebody sitting in the lab that day. So it's very labor intensive, but if you still want to use hair cards, here's the best route to go. Pull the hair, do not cut the hair from the, the bottom of the tail switch, not the tail head. Pull it from the opposite direction. This usually results in less breakage than pulling it straight out of the tail. So pull up rather than down. 
that usually results in less breakage. We need approximately 30 roots off of that tail head. So those little follicles are usually white, typically on the tip. And they must be clearly visible. And for animals with fire, finer hair, which shouldn't be a huge issue here, usually 50 to 60. Um, for animals with, that are younger than three months, TSU is re recommended because hair roots will likely not be visible typically. So pulling young calf hair typically does not work well. And of course, to go ahead and fold the card back, open the plastic cover, put the root, hair, the root end hairs in the middle of the collector, seal the plastic cover, and close the tab. And so that goes over hair. Are there any questions right quick on hair pulling? Okay, so we'll move on to blood cards right quick then. So appropriately restrain the animal. Um, locate, locate a blood vessel, either feel it or visually see it. And this is pulling out of the tail head, so clean the area and use a clean needle or lancet for every animal. And there have been other people that I have seen collect blood cards in other ways that work well. One is an ear notch method, where you notch an ear and drip blood onto the same card. But the main thing to remember with blood cards is that we want to write on the blood card the animal name and ID before we do it, and then let them sit in open air to dry before closing the flap and fill the bulk of the circle. If they do not dry properly, that leads typically to some kind of sample failure. So now let's move on to what we're passing around, the TSU gun and the TSU biles, actually. And the one we've got here today is the Allflex TSU collector. And the easiest way to do that is to and I'll give a demonstration after we're done with all the speaking for the day, after Kerry finishes up, if you guys want to come up and I'll kind of show you how the gun runs and do that. But this is really the best way to take DNA samples at birth or at branding or calf processing because it's a much simpler method than trying to pull blood on a baby calf or try to pull tail hair on a baby calf. But this is really now the most preferred way to go about collecting DNA because of the simplicity and how it's put together. And we actually have an easy time being able to scan in with barcodes these collection tubes, just like we would with blood cards or hair cards. So after we've actually collected the sample, what are some of the things we know we need to make sure and have? And how should we handle them? And proceed to ship them moving forward. So all of these samples should have at least two identifiers. We need at least an animal ID and one other identifier for the person who owns it, and then also the date like you have done with your blood cards and hair cards in the past. On the TSUs, and actually on all of the sample types, proper storage and handling away from heat and moisture, moisture along with elevated sunlight or heat is usually what leads to a failed sample in all reality. So after making sure we store them usually in just a cool dry place or at least a dry and away from sunlight place, we want to look at organizing and securing when shipping because if you get a box that, and I'll have some pictures here a little bit later in the slides that shows what sometimes boxes of blood cards and hair cards show up like can make it very difficult for your office team to sort through them and get them to the lab in Lincoln because of the organization of shipping at times. And also, of course, making sure that I, the paperwork and actual samples match up and fit together to make it as efficient and easy to process those samples as you possibly can. So <laughs> this is what I was talking about, and I've seen some of these before. I've had a box of 500 of them come in. And this is what not to do, because this here, well, really, even the TSUs, but here, that's going to take two hours for somebody to sort through just so that we know where they came from, which animals they are, and what they need to go on to and what they need to be tested for. Because there's times, I've had hair cards like this come in, 
One of them says, well, we want just hair color on this and we just want to run an actual DNA profile on that, but no add-ons. I've got to hunt through 500 hair cards just to find the one that we're going to sort out and send to a different direction first. So handling, shipping, and actually organizing is as important as making the order originally. So after we get them there, we unbox and we look and we start to process, but what makes some of these samples fail? Well, let's look at the specific sample types. On hair cards, typically it's too many follicles or with people that are just starting to collect hair, we've had more and more people that'll just cut hair off with no follicles on it. So between having too few or just mistaken type of hair collection, that's typically the failure there. Small follicles from calves, like I mentioned earlier, we really don't want anything under six months because we usually can't get enough follicle material to actually run the DNA test on it. And then fecal matter, and fecal matter and dirt in the sample also is another one of the high risk reasons of why they fail. Then we move on to blood cards. Usually it's a lack of enough blood. It's very rarely have I ever seen one that's got too much blood on it. But also, more importantly, people trying to dry that blood down before they mail in the cards. Whether that's leaving it set open on your um, dash after you pull the blood thinking the sun will dry it or whether you're taking a hair dryer to it we want that to dry at a natural rate so that all those cells remain intact and we're not actually destroying any kind of DNA so when spotting blood cards are stored we need to make sure that you invert the uh, tube four to five times if you collected a tube of blood from the tailhead and had been stored for a little while you need to re-immerse and emulsify that blood to actually get a good spotting back onto the card. Um, and then the wrong type of blood tubes are used. There are some blood tubes that won't allow for clotting actually, and we need clotting to happen to make sure that these DNA tests are act, or these DNA samples are usable when we get there. And then we really should store whole blood in a refrigerator until it's spotted back onto the card and then shipped to the lab. And then semen, you can store semen um, at room temperature or refrigerator, but they can also be easily damaged in shipping, so proper packaging's the best. I was talking to somebody about this last night on a bowl, but really the easiest way to do it is take your typical ballpoint pen and set the straw semen inside the ballpoint pen casing after you pulled out the ink well and the tip and put the cap back on it and mail it in that way. That works out well. Yeah. You don't want ETA tubes. Or you do, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Because you don't want it to form and be a solid mass in the bottom of the tube. And you've got to be able to actually get it all to re-emulsify. And I misspoke. So, no, you're fine. Um, and then why fam samples fail on the TSUs, or the Tipifix tags? There's no actual sample in the tag, um, which we have a system where a green ball from the top is actually pushed to the bottom with a red plunger after a um, good sample has been taken. And I'll show that after a bit if we can do a demonstration with the AllFlex collector. Um, there is a sample that gets trapped in between the plunger and the tube and is not fully emulsified into the liquid, or I'm sorry, in, put into the liquid. And then uh, sometimes guys will accidentally take a test out of a tattooed area, which um, that's the word I'm looking for, contaminates the sample. So storage of these TSUs is do not have them stored in a high temperature or direct sunlight environment. Unpreserved, unpreserved, it should be shipped next day and stored in a freezer both. Then long term, TSUs are viable for collection or viable 12 months after collection. And here are some of the other general issues that we have with actual failures. Cross-contamination between animals. We're not making sure to clean our needles or clean 
um, our other sample tools. Chemical contamination, like I'd said, with the actual tattoo ink, some insect repellents and cleaning agents actually can deteriorate a sample quality. And then the most common, improper storage, heat exposure, like in a vehicle on a dash or something, um, foreign material, and then improper frozen storage, of freezing and thawing too many times if you had power outage or something like that. So, and then on blood cards and hair cards, insufficient sampling, and also shipping that does not deliver it in the manner that it should. So here are some of the best practices. Clean the area on the animal to take the sample from. Make sure that an adequate sample is taken. Fully fill the circle on the blood cards. Make sure you've got 30 to 40 follicles on the hair cards and make sure that, like I said, I'll show you the TSU tubes, that we've got the green ball on the bottom of the TSU tubes with the red plunger at the top. Make sure that your information's recorded accurately. This is one of the most difficult things at times with any producer is making sure that we don't lose track of which animals in which testing, vial, card, or semen straw even. Proper sample storage. Just set aside somewhere you can refrigerate or you can make sure is out of direct sunlight and temperature controlled to make sure those samples that you're paying for are going to be viable. And organizing when shipping. This isn't only just for sample failure reasons. This is so that we can move through the process efficiently and make sure that your actual samples and DNA results are returned in a most timely manner. And then proper identification. So once again, once they hit your office, they can be sorted and sent on and then come back without any hiccups and without anything slowing down the chain to make sure your results are back as soon as possible. So I'll go ahead and take some questions then. and we can do a sample pull on those typically. And that's just the stated usage. And also, we should have an electronic ability to go back and look at them. I also have suggested at times that if you are concerned about that, pull hair, and you don't have to put them in a hair card, but put them in an envelope with a tag number on it and put it in a file. It's pretty easy to do it that way. We've got quite a few guys that pull a backup that way. They submit a TSU because it's really one of their favorite ways to do it because it's less contamination, but they'll pull hair as a backup while they're there at the shoot. Yeah? As an overall, you know, we have the blood, we have the hair, and now we have the mm -hmm. tag. It, as an overall, and true essence, which one is the absolute best viable for total accuracy? Just because of the lack or not lack, the less chance of having a contamination, the TSU has a lower failure rate than any of the others. I believe it's the most accurate way to collect it just because of the simplicity and also the ability to collect a clean sample more regularly without, hu it's really operators that can have some kind of contamination fall onto a cart. Any other questions? All right, and like I said, after Carrie finishes up, I will uh, stick around and be happy to give a demonstration on that TSU wherever it ended up at. So, thank you. He's been doing uh, EPD evaluations in the industry for quite some time, especially in the American breeds. Um, and we're fortunate enough to do quite a bit of genetic evaluation um, for breeds and large commercial ranches in the United States. Um, and so that's what I regularly do. I run uh, genetic evaluations, including the Beefmaster one. And then I also come up with uh, new EPDs that any of our customers are looking at, um, trying to apply to their associations or their herds. And so that's sort of my role here at Neogen. Um, today I was asked to sort of give you a genomics 201 speech. Um, so what's the final product? Why do we do this genomic testing? You know, you uh, take a sample, 
you send it to the lab. Um, it's a good sample. They send you kind of the results um, after going through the lab, sort of what Jill had talked about, and then what? Um, and then you hopefully get a genomic enhanced DPD. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about how that actually works. If I can get this to work. Here we go. Um, so this is sort of what I thought I would be doing when I pictured myself as a geneticist, you know, um, sort of contemplating where life comes from while looking at a double helix in a really sporty white lab coat. You know, that's sort of what you imagine as a little girl, right? Uh, at least me. Uh, this, I swear, sometimes is what Lance thinks that I do, <laughs> maybe secretly. Um, that, you know, I have this big cauldron and I'm sort of cooking up the numbers with all my equations and things like that. This is what I actually do. And that's kind of terrifying, but um, get really familiar with this equation because we're going to talk about it quite a little bit today. Um, what I do is very statistical. I do a lot with math, um, a lot with algebra. It's a really big part of how we incorporate these DNA samples into your selection decisions. And this is how it actually looks when I'm doing it. That's terrifying, right? Like this big black screen full of numbers. But this is actually what it looks like when your guys' evaluation is going well. I took this screenshot the last time I did your all's evaluation. So this means you guys are doing a really great job if the numbers are running like this. So I showed these equations before. These are terrifying, right? I mean, like, I still probably have sort of like post-traumatic stress from my PhD looking at these equations, right? Having to remember these. Maybe I should have tattooed them on my arms so that I would just have them with me at all times kind of a thing. Um, but when we really start to think about what these equations tell us, it's really important for the, bit, for the basis of genomic enhanced EPDs that we know how we get regular EPDs. Because if you don't have really solid information on your regular EPDs, your genomic enhancements aren't going to help you very much. So let's look at this equation. What is it telling us? First, we need to ask, what is the question? What trait are we trying to predict? Is it birth weight? Is it marbling? Is it yearling weight? That's what that part of the, question, the equation is asking. The second thing is, what could mess our answer up? What affects that trait that we can't really get a prediction on outside of your herd? or outside of your herd. We can't compare those two if we don't look at this part of the equation. So that's where contemporary group comes in. That's where age comes in. That's where gender comes in. We don't want to be comparing our steers to our heifers, right? And then this part of the equation asks, what is the subject? So am I trying to get a prediction on all the animals, or do I want a prediction on just the sire? Um, when we started out predicting EPDs, it was mostly on the sire side. Now we uh, run an animal model, which means both sires and dams and young calves all get EPDs in your herds. And then there's always a little bit that we can't predict through the equations. That's called noise, or you might hear it called bias or a residual. And we put that at the end of the equation to make sure it doesn't mess our answer up. So if I put this in real life terms, say we're talking about calving ease. That goes here on this equation. Things that can mess our answer up that we don't want to add bias to the equation are things like herd or age. And we mainly want to get predictions on animals, not just sires, but every animal in our herd. And then there's the noise there at the end. And we all know that we want more accurate predictions because on your end, what that comes to is less risk, right? So when you're selling a bull or when you're buying a bull or when you're just making breeding decisions, you don't want to be making risky decisions because in the cow industry and the beef industry, those decisions last a really long time. When you look at the cow and then her calf, those animals are going to be around for quite some time. So you want to really make accurate decisions. Why does accuracy matter? It matters, right? 
I mean, I kind of feel like this is how decisions in the beef industry go because they're like semi-permanent, honestly. Um, it really feels that way. So um, I know you guys thought that I was gonna come in here and just immediately start talking about all the cool stuff we do with genomics and things like that, but only after I really hammer this home that you can't have good genomic enhanced EPDs without having good regular EPDs. And that means being really diligent in how you're reporting information, reporting information on your entire calf crop, things like that, okay? So now let's talk about the fun stuff. So remember this equation. Where does the information come from in this equation? And Jill talked about this a little bit. Uh, we can get information on the animal itself, that animal's own birth weight record for example, we can get information on a bull's birth weight record and those records from his progeny. We can get information from his relatives, his half siblings, his full siblings, his sire and dam. And we can also get information from a DNA test. But how do we get that information? So you send in a sample. It gets processed through the lab. Everything works okay, but how, where does that information actually come from? So I kind of love this quote by Sir Isaac Newton. He said, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. Everything that we do today, especially with genomics, really comes from the ideas of this guy. Um, does anybody know who this is? Like a million bonus points today if anybody knows who this is. This guy is Gregor Mendel. You might remember like from high school biology, right? Um, he is the one that proved the theory of inheritance so that we inherit genes from our parents. Um, he used uh, sweet pea plants and he was looking at color and he figured out that you could predict the pattern of inheritance in sweet pea plants by looking at the genes of the parents, right? So this guy has everything to do with what we do today in making your genomic enhanced EPDs. And so the reason that Gregor Mendel is so important is because he came up this, with this idea of independent assortment. And really all that means is that just because your parent has a trait doesn't mean um, that you are gonna inherit that trait as an offspring, right? Like say my mother has blonde hair and here I come out with brown hair. That does happen, right? And it's because you don't inherit every single gene that your parents have expressed. Um, and so that's the idea of independent assortment. Um, and that happens in meiosis. So if you remember meiosis is how, you know, sort of cells split apart to replicate their DNA and meet up with other cells, right? Um, and so one of the reasons that we don't inherit all of the same genes from our parents is because when cells separate, um, they, the DNA in them separates at random. So we don't necessarily get 50% of our DNA from our mother and 50% from our father because the genes separate at random. It could really be 0%, it could be 1%, it could be 5%. That's why we wanna do DNA testing because with EPDs we expect it to be 50-50. And in real life, because of independent assortment, it could be any number in between there. Um, and there's also recombination. And so that's kind of a fancy word for just saying that the DNA breaks in places and it gets filled in with DNA from either the mother or the father, okay? And so all of these things create variation um, and we know how this works, right? Because even if you have full siblings, that doesn't mean that they're gonna perform exactly like each other. So that kind of proves this theory that even if you have the same mother and father, the real genes that you get could be different each time that mating occurs. And so that's why the DNA tests are so important. They're telling us what DNA that animal actually inherited from its mother and father, okay? So now that I've thoroughly 
confused everybody, or maybe your eyes are a little bit glazed over, you know, from that trip down memory, memory lane to high school biology, I wanted to talk about a little bit of jargon that you'll hear a lot, especially like around the lab. Um, you hear the word SNP a lot. What does that mean? Um, it stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, and basically, it's just the most common source of genetic variation that we see in animals. And it's basically a place along the genome. So does everybody remember that there's four base pairs, A, T, G, C, in the DNA, and they're always paired you know, straight across because there's two strands of DNA. So where there's a G up here, there should also be a G. Does that make sense? Or there should also be a C. So if we start out with this strand at the top and we have a C, it should be a, the same down here. But in a mutation, in a SNP, it changes for some reason. When it replicates, it doesn't replicate right the first time, and so it'll change from one base pair to another, okay? And so those are the things that we actually look at all across the genome to try and decide how they influence your trait, like birth weight. And so at the lab, when they take your sample, they go through and blow it up really big. I mean, it's still microscopic, but big for at the lab. And then they go through and they test for every single SNP, every single place where it should be a C, but it's actually a T or whatever else, okay? And so those become beacons of light, like reds and greens. And then they go through in data services and they add up all of the places where something should have been a T and it's actually a C. Um, and then when I come in, um, at the very beginning, we do um, association studies to say how do those mutations affect birth weight, okay? So every place that that mutation affects birth weight across the genome, we add it up, um, and that's sort of like the genomic portion of an EPD. Now, it's important to note that a SNP might not be the actual cause of a change in birth weight, but it could be close to a location where there's a change in birth weight. Um, that's called linkage disequilibrium, and it just means that those two uh, locations are close together. And this is kind of um, how I explain that. So which of these bananas is one that you'd want to eat? <laughs> Not the brown one, right? Um, so you don't know that because you've actually opened the banana and looked at it and said, this is a good banana. You're using the skin as an indicator um, for which is actually a good banana, right? And that's sort of what SNPs do. They're an indicator for which genes we actually care about that affect birth weight, okay? Um, I think I might have stolen this example from Dr. Megan Rolf. I think that she's talking to you all tomorrow. So you have to promise me that if you see this slide again, you're gonna smile and you're gonna pretend like you've never seen it before, okay? So we use that information that we get from the SNPs along with phenotypes, along with progeny and relatives um, to create a genomic enhanced EPD. I get this question a lot. If I do genomic testing, can I stop collecting uh, phenotype information? Can I stop collecting weights? Do I have to follow my animals through to carcass? Yes, you do. Because I'm the geneticist and I say so. No, that's not how it works. But you want the most complete information you can on an animal so that you can make good decisions on him, right? So if I can collect weights and I can have information on his pedigree and his progeny, and I can have genomic testing, that gives me the most complete information I can on that animal. And I'm gonna do that because I'm a great beef master producer. So I wanted to finish up here talking about a little bit of myth busters. Has anybody ever seen that show where they do like the science, like can you actually hang on to the hood of a car while it's going kind of a thing? Uh, one of my faves, so I thought we'd follow that theme. And you tell me if this is true or if it's a myth. I should not report my calves that don't perform well because it will make the rest of my calves look bad. 
Is this true or false, you guys? False, good job. So EPDs are all about differences. So even though we report like the individual EPD numbers, what actually matters is the percentile ranks. How does that animal compare to the rest of the animals in his contemporary group, right? And so if you only report good animals in a group, it changes the group average, okay? It, ra it raises it up. So when you do that, you make your great animals look average. And it doesn't give us enough information about your contemporary group to know that that animal is really great, right? So the bad calves are just as important, if not more so, to report than your good calves, okay? Myth number two, do, doing genomic testing will make the EPDs on my animals always look more favorable. No? Yeah, okay. So I think sometimes people think if I do genomic testing, my birth weights are gonna look lower, my yearling weights are gonna be higher, I'll have great ribeye area, great marbling. That's not how it works, okay? Genomic testing always adds accuracy on lowly accurate animals, okay? The point is, is that we can point out a good animal for you just as well as we can point out a really bad animal, okay? Not that you guys have any of those, but I have seen them before. Um, the EPDs themselves have an equal chance of going up or down because they are unbiased, okay? So that means by definition, they have an equal chance of going up or down, but they will always be more accurate on lowly accurate animals, okay? Last thing, genomic testing can help select for traits that are hard to collect and make selection progress on. True or false, were you guys listening to Jill? She said this, she had this answer in her slides. True or false? True, yeah. Okay, so genomic testing is especially useful on traits with low heritability. The reason for this is low heritability comes from a really small amount of variation. So how much of the answer are we actually getting to by regular EPDs? It's really low on these traits because we don't know a lot about these traits or we don't have a lot of data on them. So adding a genomic test adds a lot of answer, a lot of information for us getting the answer on those traits. Okay. It also helps to shorten the generation interval. So Jill talked about this a little bit, but if you can make decisions on an animal when he's young before you even use him as a bull, or if you can make decisions on an animal as an embryo and decide whether or not you wanna actually implant that embryo, it really speeds up your selection process, okay? So that's one of the most important things about um, genomic testing. So I just wanted to close with this kind of information. Um, we have about 9.8 billion people to feed on the earth by the year 2050. That is a lot. That's like more than we've ever had to feed before in the history of the world, okay? And so it's really important that we take advantage of every tool that we have in our toolkit to make good progress, right? The U.S. is one of the most efficient beef production systems in the world. We pr um, produce 20% of the world's beef with only 9% of the world's cows, and we do that by using this kind of technology. So, I'm open to any questions. Um, so Jill had a slide on this, but in an animal that has like no accuracy, like just his own birth weight, no progeny, very few relatives, you would go to 0.2, yeah, a 0.2 increase on that animal. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, so it would kind of look like he had what, like five or 10 progeny on the ground, an animal that's had no progeny at all. Okay, and it gets lower as that animal is more accurate on his own. So if that animal is already a 0.5 accuracy, it wouldn't add as much. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Other questions? 
Okay, well, Nate's gonna be around if you guys wanna look at how to actually use that TSU gun. I know it can be a little confusing sometimes, especially on how you get the sample out. So he'll be around, and Jill and I will be around for a little while longer if anyone has other questions. Okay, yes, sir. Sure. This one? Mm hmm Stability. Yeah, so actually you guys do a really good job on your disposal codes and those are super important to stability um, because they tell us if a cow was cold for actual reproductive failure, right? We wanna know, does that animal stay in the herd because she successfully calves each year? Was she cold for a reason that was not reproductive? Like she had bad feet or something to that nature. She had a bad temperament, right? The other thing that's very important is making sure to record calves. And I'll have to ask Lance, and I think you guys do have a way to record calves even if you don't wanna register them. It's like, like a compute, right? Yeah, and that's important too because that tells us even though you don't wanna register that calf, she still has calves successfully. So she didn't drop out of the herd or just not have a calf that year we have to know the calving records. Because if we don't, say she did calve successfully, but calved in another breed or whatever it was, um, we assume that she failed, that she did not have a calf. And then we're docking her when she really did calve successfully. So those are the two most important things. Record your calves and record disposal codes correctly when you cull an animal. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mean feed a... That's right. And I think that is why the disposal code information is important because then we can really start to pull apart the animals that leave your all's herds and say, why are they leaving the herds? So, you know, potentially, eventually we could have an EPD about um, you know, feet and leg structure because we have disposal codes that say these cows were cold for feet and leg structure and we pull that apart from a cow leaving the herd because she did not calve. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you very much for having us. <laughs>